The following is a text exchange which occurred between brothers on July 11th, 2021. 11.06 p.m. Can elk climb a balcony? Like, I think there's probably four feet down to the ground. Well, elk can run 45 miles per hour and have been recorded as jumping as high as eight feet. So, yeah. My balcony is probably about 12 feet wide, and the door I've left open is a normal door. So assuming an elk gets a good run and launches over the balcony, what are the chances it hits the open door cleanly rather than crashing through the giant window? And is either scenario better for me? My bed is approximately half an elk length away from the window. There are supposed to be coyotes and rabbits, too. If you are not wearing shoes, then a clean entry is ultimately safer. I think the best bet is to go under your bed. They are too tall to get under there, right? I faced off against a coyote while running once. Hmm. I've never battled anything larger than skunks. And cars. I'm fairly certain I told you about having to turn around on the bike path once after happening upon a stare-off between a skunk and a turkey. No way I was running between those two. I would ask who would win the battle, but I don't actually like thinking about animal fights. Me neither. Straight from the heartland, this is Things I Text My Brother. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of Things I Text My Brother, a series of conversations which have taken place between the Brothers Drew Yard on subjects spanning the neighborhood and the globe, which will hopefully leave you smarter, kinder, and better looking. Today we're going to jump off from that dramatic reading that you just heard and discuss the topics therein. Maybe we'll talk about elk. Maybe we'll talk about elks. Maybe we'll talk about hotel balconies. Or maybe we'll talk about stare downs between skunks and turkeys. But we haven't plotted an exact course because we want you to join us on that journey. I'm Jeff. This is Brad. Let's talk about our texts. But before we jump into the text that you just heard, like an elk soaring through a window under the cover of darkness, we need to take a look back because it's always important to make time to cleanse ourselves of our past sins and to continue our boundless quest for self-improvement through worthless information. Thus it's time for ablutions and edification. Brother Brad, we're both going to drop some knowledge on people today. What edification are you providing? In episode 10, we talked about a border incident in Belgium, but also the difference between poison and venom. Mm. A test you aced, by the way. Yeah, I wouldn't now, but I did that day. You did. Anyway, you asked science to find out if human stomach acid could dissolve snake venom in that conversation. Is science finally getting back to us? As it so happens, at least one scientist <laughs> is. There are probably many others, but I didn't look for any others. Uh, but there is one scientist who had thoughts on it. Mm. What do you think, yay or nay, to venom being dissolved by stomach acid? I'm going to say nay. Well, that's wrong. According to Dr. Ronald Jenner, venom mm. evolution expert at the Natural History Museum in London, human stomach acid would dissolve snake venom. Huzzah! And I quote, I wouldn't recommend anyone do it, but this is why it is technically possible to drink venom. It can't be absorbed through tissue, and then stomach acid messes up the peptides and proteins, destroying the venom. So there you go. As often is the case, we ask, and science answers. That's actually really interesting stuff. I had forgotten that I didn't know that, but now I'm glad that I do. Well, you said nay during this episode, and I said nay in episode 10 when you asked me. Huh. Well, I'll have no memory of any of it very soon anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Fair enough. So you also are going to share a little bit of edification, yes? I am. You may remember from our most recent episode, episode 36, where we talked about the African-American football player Johnny Bright being assaulted repeatedly on the gridiron. We also talked about two schools leaving the Missouri Valley Conference after the incident. One was Johnny Bright's university, which was Drake. Do you remember the other one? I don't remember the other one. It happens to be named Bradley University. Oh, yeah. I remember now. Because Bradley is such an important name, I got to wondering, who is who is Bradley University named after? Do you happen to know the answer to that question? I don't happen to know that question. Well, I'm about to edify you, brother. This campus, which has many gargoyles and has a mascot that's now a gargoyle, even though they may or may not still be the Braves, I don't know. Bradley University was founded by none other than Lydia Moss Bradley. 
Yes, indeed. It was founded by a woman. Let me read a little bit for you from the Bradley University website, basically talking about the courage, strength, and determination of Miss Lydia Moss Bradley. Okay. Lydia Moss Bradley had seen all of her hopes, ambitions, and dreams for her six children end in their untimely deaths. She and her husband, one Tobias Bradley, had devoted much time, thought, and discussion to how their wealth might be used as a fitting memorial to their deceased children. But guess what happened to Tobias Bradley? What happened to Tobias Bradley? He died before their dream could Ah. be realized. Oh, no. Mrs. Bradley, who they had discussed coming up with an orphanage, she decided, as the article says, after some study and travel to various institutions, that instead of an orphanage, she wanted to found a school where young people could learn to do practical things to prepare them for living in the modern world. And thus, in October of 1897, Bradley Polytechnic opened its doors Originally organized as a four-year academy, then a four-year college in 1920, and a university granting graduate degrees in 1946. That is your namesake university. What do you think of all that? I am proud to say that I share a name. You're proud to be a Bradley. Well, you should be because I looked a little bit more into Miss Lydia Bradley, and she was a pretty cool lady just overall. She was one of the first women ever to have a prenuptial agreement. That was after her first husband died, Tobias Bradley. She got married to another guy, presumably to keep that fortune intact. There was a prenup, and good on her because in 1869, they were married. In 1873, they were divorced. I presume she got to keep the money. She had churches built. She had parks built. She donated land. She built a home for widows. She was the first woman to serve on a national bank board, and she won a Supreme Court case in a land dispute. So if you happen to have a university that shares your name, Sharing the name with Lydia Moss Bradley is a pretty good thing to do, so you win this edification, Brad. I always like to win. All right, Bradley, now that we've been edified about Venom and Bradley, why don't you get us started on today's text exchange? A couple of things I learned about elk. Oh. They can and have broken through windows, which makes sense due to their size. Oh. They do sometimes eat eggs or meat, including baby geese and some rabbits, but they usually opt for an herbivore diet. So if you combine those things together, I do believe an elk could come for you in your room if you were, say, eating a giant bowl of salad with baby rabbits in it on your balcony. That might just entice it to jump up there. (laughs) With baby rabbits in it. Yeah. Yeah. I was trying to think back to the day that I sent you that text, and it would have been 11.06 p.m. your time. I believe it would have been something like 9.06 p.m. my time. Well, only my time matters. In Mesa Verde National Park, whoever's time it was, I sent you the text. The interesting thing about it is Mesa Verde, this national park in which I was staying in a lovely hotel on top of this mesa that had this balcony looking out over this great scene. Yes, there could have been elk out there, but there also could have been shrews, bats, squirrels, rabbits, mountain lions, bobcats. Skunks, badgers, foxes, coyotes, porcupines, and even an American black bear, which, by the way, I have since seen in Mesa Verde, a black bear. Hmm. So I don't really know why I was so concerned at that moment about an elk hopping through my window. In fact, later on during that same trip, I stayed in a hotel that was named after elk, and I wasn't worried about it there. But on that night, I was definitely wondering about elk jumping through the window. So it's good to know that at least they could under the salad-eating, baby rabbit-eating conditions. Right, right. I mean, I I think it's possible. But if it makes you feel any better, if you remember back to episode 9, Waldo and the Feline Inquisition. Barely. We did a quick list of the deadliest creatures on Earth to humans. The mosquito Mm. was the worst offender. Oh, that's right. But elk didn't even make the top 20. Hippos and elephants did as creatures that are primarily herbivores. But elk, not so much. So maybe not so much to worry about. It would be more an injury of convenience because you were in the way as it was trying to escape after it jumped in your room and you threw the salad and and the baby rabbits ran all around. (laughs) That's, that's That's how I'm picturing this whole thing happening on your balcony. And as you're stating all this, I'm just starting to recall a much more recent encounter that I had with a bull elk Where was I? I was in Tussian, Arizona, just outside of the Grand Canyon, and I was walking to dinner, and I came upon an elk that was a good 15 or 20 feet away from me before I realized I was near it. So I kind of backed up a little bit and started filming, and I thought I was at a safe distance, but then the elk started 
just very calmly walking down the street toward me and I got out of the street and moved around a corner. But I realized soon that I was backed into a corner and had he charged me, I would have most certainly died. So I need to stop worrying about elk going through balcony windows and start worrying about elk that are 20 feet away from me on flat surfaces. I did see some elk recently Mm. uh, when my family recently visited the Great Smoky Mountains this summer. We happened upon a grazing herd near a Kanalufti visitor center as we were exiting the park on the southern side. I had driven through the park and were exiting it. And we had planned to go see elk in another area, the Cataluchi area of the park, because that's where they first introduced them. And they were there for a long time, and they've sort of made their way around the park as they've expanded their herd. Way down yonder in the Cataluchi? Yeah, that drive to the Cataluchi was seriously white-knuckle driving for me. You drive in and up this mountain, and it's stone paths, and I was not experienced there. And it made me nervous. And then on our way back, there was a deluge, so... Now you've got rain pouring down the mountain. And frankly, I had already seen elk at Akanalefti. That should have been enough for me because the ones we saw in Cataluchi were the exact same, just way harder to get to. Oh, You said that they could run 45 miles per hour? So says the internet. Is that faster or slower than the top end speed of Usain Bolt during his world record 100 meter? (laughs) I have no idea. Well, I do. 45 miles per hour that Elk apparently could top out at is quite a bit faster than Usain Bolt's world record. That would have broken down to a speed of 23.35 miles per hour or 37.58 kilometers per hour. So he was going about half as fast as the top end speed for an Elk. All of that is moving pretty fast. How long? I would be curious if an Elk could keep that 45 miles per hour longer than 100 meters. I don't know. Did you say how high they could jump the elk? Up to eight feet. They've been known to jump as high as eight feet. So if an elk were to jump eight foot even, do you think that that would be higher or lower than the record running high jump for a human being? The record running high jump for a human being is higher than eight feet. How high is it? Eight feet, seven inches. Eight feet, point four, six inches. I don't know. It's over eight feet. 2.45 meters. And the man who did it, it was way back in the year of our Lord, 1993. He was a Cuban named Javier Sotomayor. Isn't that amazing that the the high jump was back in 1993, the high jump record? That's, I'm trying to count my fingers. That's, that's almost 30 years ago. Yeah. Fosbury flop and stuff. Yeah. The Sotomayor flop. So my air flop. Well, that makes some sense to me that the human could jump higher. I thought that was the case. But the real question is, what if we taught the elk the Fosbury flop? Would that change the numbers? I think their antlers would get in the way because they're turning upside down. I think it's better for them to jump feet first because they can control their feet better than their antlers. Well, maybe if they do it right when they drop their antlers every year and they're antlerless, or it could just be a female elk. Yeah. This definitely leaves us open for a pay-per-view TV event in which elk and human compete in the high jump because it sounds like they're a pretty even match. And of course, we don't have Javier Sotomayor in his prime to do the jump at this point. So we'd have to find somebody who could get close to his mark. And who knows if that person exists? I'm not up on these things. Uh, You mentioned that you saw a black bear when you were out and about, and you've seen some moose and you've been cornered a bit. You've spent a fair amount of time hanging out in national parks. Mm -hmm. Have you been there when there was an animal attack, like in in Yellowstone or? Not anything like on the day, but I've been there shortly after them. Like while people were getting overturned by bison this year up in Yellowstone, I was a couple weeks south working my way that direction so i haven't missed him by much but man you gotta be pretty silly to do a lot of the things to see people doing we were at a park in pennsylvania cherry spring state park a few years ago Uh, it's a certified dark sky park in the united states where you know there aren't too many of those here over here in the midwest eastern side of the country where you can go out and you can see the milky way in all its glory more or less and so we were enjoying a view of the night sky Earlier in the day, my son and I had been out for a walk, and we saw a black bear hanging around the campground, just outside the campground. It didn't attack us or anything. It was a long way away. They're super nearsighted. So it stood up and started looking at us, and we slowly backed away like you're supposed to. And it went its way, and we went ours. Uh, Later that evening, there was quite the commotion at the campground because the bear had made its way to the campground because people weren't taking care of their food and trash and everything. And it was wandering around the campground looking for stuff. And the guy in the campsite next to us started shooting a handgun randomly at the bear into the woods. No idea what he was shooting at. Couldn't see anything. 
And there were a bunch of teenagers from Philadelphia there on a trip, and they were screaming on a regular basis. I'm assuming one of them was probably outside banging on their tents and stuff and scaring them. To which then my wife very helpfully starts yelling out, put away your trash, get in your tents and go to sleep. (laughs) (laughs) And did everybody listen? Mostly, yeah. Except for the people next to us who packed in a hurry and tried to leave before the police arrived because they were shooting a handgun randomly in a campground. Good idea. Yeah. So we had a nice conversation with the park ranger the next day because he was asking, since we were next to the site, what we heard and saw. And we were telling him. And he was talking to me about the stupid things that people do around uh, (laughs) rattlesnakes and bears in the park and said he just the day before in a parking lot on the other side of the park, there were some gentlemen poking a rattlesnake with a stick. Yeah, that's smart. And he came and he said, stop poking the rattlesnake with a stick and just move along. But he was jealous because we saw this bear and he said he's been trying to see that bear for a couple of years because he knew it was around, but he hadn't seen it. Hmm. Yeah. I was reading about animal attacks that had occurred specifically in hotels, or I was trying to read about that. And I found out that mostly in hotels, the animal related injuries are being caused by pets or service dogs even, or sometimes there was an odd case of like an aggressive monkey in the countries that have monkeys around. But I didn't see any signs of elk attacks in hotels. In searching for animal attacks in hotels, it was just a trail that I could never get to the bottom of. And most of it wasn't interesting. Closest thing I found to a legitimate animal attack in a hotel in kind of an unexpected way happened in 2016 when a leopard probably saw his own reflection in a hotel room window while running from some wild dogs. He blasted through a window in a hotel room in India, ran across a couple on their honeymoon at four something in the morning, ran straight into the bathroom because he was freaked out. The guy thought quickly enough to jump up and lock him in the bathroom. And then while they were waiting to try and get the authorities and get him out, the leopard found his way out some kind of ventilation window in the bathroom. The wife actually said that she thought it was pretty cool. The husband was kind of upset because there were no bars over the windows for protection, but the wife said it was pretty cool because nobody gets to see a leopard that close. That was a good attitude. That is a positive attitude. I suppose with hindsight, you're fine. And if you don't scare easily, like my wife, clearly not afraid of the bear in the campsite, even though we are in a soft-sided tent. She's just like, go to sleep. It's going to be fine. So she probably would have an encounter like that and think it was cool and not think much of it, whereas I would then be scared to ever go to sleep again. Yeah. Well, I respect your wife and her understanding of nature and her ability to control other campers. Even though she's not very good at Lord of the Rings trivia, she does have some good skills. Yeah. I did see a video on the internet and I did find out it was real. There was a teenage kid who came home from something and he walked into the house and walked through the back and the back sliding door was broken. Yeah. You know, he's kind of walking around. He's got his phone out. He's calling his mom and trying to talk to her. He's walking through the house. And he walks in and he gets around the corner and the dog's barking like crazy outside yeah. and he came in with him. And he goes in, he opens the door of the bathroom and there's a goat in there. And he's like, <laughs> nope, 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 nope. And it's all recorded on their camera in their house. He's like, nope, nope. I've seen that video. I couldn't remember what animal it was. And I love that reaction. He's like, nope. <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> and just walks out. Yeah. Well, I started to branch out and look at other things kind of tangentially related to this subject. And so... First off, I was going to look for just balcony stories, stories about balconies that were interesting. And I found out that when you search for stories about balconies, you don't get that much. And the stuff you do get is either humans throwing other humans or themselves or animals off balconies, which none of that is fun. So once I sifted through those, I got to just current news type stories like the fact that the United States killed an Egyptian terrorist with a drone that had a bunch of swinging knives while he was standing on a balcony doing just his morning kind of Zen routine out there. And I saw that in England, apparently, it's a big debate over who's in the royal family by who gets to stand on a balcony for some ceremony, which I didn't care at all about. And the only other story I saw that was not a human or animal getting thrown off a balcony or somebody getting chopped up by a drone on a balcony was a woman who said that living in Zurich is too expensive. So she put a tent on her Zurich apartment balcony and was trying to rent it out for 400 pounds a month to somebody who would have no access to the apartment, just the tent on the tiny little balcony. How did that person get to the balcony? I have no idea. And and the articles didn't explain it. It did say that they probably wouldn't pass any codes in Zurich and that she probably wouldn't be able to do this. Yeah, mostly depressing stuff and no really good stories. But then I tightened my search to stories about animals on balconies. And I got even more stories about animals being thrown off of balconies. I got a lot of advertisement for Disney's Animal Kingdom. 
wherein you can apparently stay in a resort that you can look out your window and see animals. Okay. But I did find two stories that I really liked on the subject of animals and balconies. All right, I'm ready. I'm ready. So I'm going to lead off with one of them here. This one involves Mr. Boris Kozlowski. Guess what country he's in? Poland. Yeah, he's in Poland. Mr. Boris Kozlowski, he just wanted to mow his lawn one day, but his lawn mower was broken. So he's out there trying to fix his lawn, and one of his neighbors just happened to walk by him. His neighbor is Jacob Pancheski, and he says, Boris, why are you bothering to try and fix up that lawn mower? I've got my horse, Delina. Why don't you just borrow my horse? And Delina can just mow the lawn like animals do and just chew up all the grass. This sounds like a great story, right? It does so far. Yeah, no balconies, no nothing involved. Everything goes well. Delina comes over in this town in Poland. She eats the lawn outside of Boris's house, but it's actually an apartment that Boris lives in. And that becomes important because I'm not sure what kind of neighborhood Boris lives in. But the horse is done mowing the lawn, did a great job. He doesn't own the horse. And he says, I didn't want anybody to steal the horse. It did a great job on the lawn, and I wouldn't leave the lawnmower lying around afterwards either. So he's got to do something with the horse. But he lives in an apartment. So what does Boris do, Brad? Chained the horse up to the balcony railing like you do a bicycle. Yeah, except he doesn't chain it. He walks it up the staircase in his apartment building and puts it out on the balcony. And it's not going to go anywhere because it's up in the air. You know, they got a fence around it. It's not going to come in the house and make a mess either. And so people are walking by this apartment in Poland, and they're just seeing a horse hanging out in this. And it's not a big balcony. There are pictures of it that you can find. It's just a balcony that's about as wide as, you know, a two-pane glass door, and in this case, about as long enough for a horse to stand in. So a bunch of pictures start going around on the internet of the horse on this balcony. But eventually, Jacob Pincheski, the owner of the horse, gets off work or wherever he is, and he comes over and he gets his horse and he says, this horse isn't scared of anything. I guess a flight of stairs was no big deal to him. I love the idea of just walking around a bunch of apartments somewhere in Poland or anywhere else for that matter and just seeing a horse chilling on a balcony. That made me happy. All right. This story was reported on BBC.com. It was also reported on NotesFromPoland.com. Yet another Polish story. I wasn't searching for Polish animal balcony stories, and yet both of the stories I found were from Poland. I'm going to leave out one important element in the story. And actually, as I'm reading this, I'm noticing that I don't think there's any balcony involved, but it came up in my balcony search. It certainly involves a window. The headline is, and I'm going to leave out the most important word and see if you can figure it out by the end. Okay. Mystery tree creature reported to animal services. Actually, a blank. So now I'm going to read you a little bit of this story as written by Daniel Tillis from NotesFromPoland.com. A mysterious beast lurking in a tree in Krakow has been identified as a blank by a local animal charity, which was called out by a worried resident. If you had to guess so far, do you think that this creature is a living creature ultimately that they find? I think it's a chupacabra. A chupacabra. The Krakow Society for the Protection of Animals which runs the city's main animal shelter, reports that a desperate woman called to say that there's a creature hiding in the tree for two days, presumably outside her window. She said, People are not opening their windows because they're afraid it will come into her home. Everyone is scared of it. Asked to describe the animal, she said that it could be, well, first she said it could be a lagoon, but that's because she had forgotten the word for iguana. (laughs) Ah. <laughs> yes. So the authorities are alerted that there's either a lagoon or an iguana in the tree outside a window that's been scaring people for two days. The animal shelter folks, they determine that it's not an April Fool's joke and they send out a, a team to check on the animal. And the organization assumed that, as the article says, if it was a tropical reptile, it could have died and therefore remained motionless in the tree. At the scene, the team spotted the creature. It's brown skin glistening in the sun, the article says. When we looked more closely, the poor thing had no legs or head. Now what do you think it is? No legs, no head. Uh, A locust. Well, here's the answer. As the Krakow Society posted on their Facebook page, we already knew that we could not help the creature. The mysterious iguana turned out to be a croissant. (laughs) The charity assured that the story was completely genuine and added that it still encouraged anyone with concerns about the well-being of an animal to contact them. It's better to check and be pleasantly disappointed than to not react. 
It was a croissant. And if people want to go, you can just Google this croissant creature, crack out, whatever, and you will see a picture of a croissant in a tree that was mistaken for at least a couple days and had the whole neighborhood in fear. You know, I, I was going to say, iguanas are known to fall out of trees when it gets cold. And if it was April yeah. in Poland, I would assume it's cold enough for an iguana to fall from a tree. Yeah. So there's that. The only thing I was thinking of when I heard this story was that viral video that just barely preceded viral videos is like 2005 or 2006 or something from I think it was Alabama, like Mobile, Alabama. So these people said that they saw something in a tree and then the police sketch was like the crudest police sketch ever. It looks kind of like a basic leprechaun. I don't know. But they went out and interviewed the local people about this leprechaun, and they were all excited about seeing a leprechaun. And it was March, so it was getting close to St. Patrick's Day. And everybody had their theory. And some guy's like, I think it's a leprechaun. And somebody else is like, I think it's this. And this one lady says, it, it could be a crackhead that got a hold of the wrong stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and the newscasters so the the clip that went viral with it was a couple of, i think it was morning newscasters actually and they were just laughing people should definitely google alabama leprechaun tree whatever and you'll get the story of the leprechaun in the tree i don't know if there are any balconies involved in that but it's still definitely worth seeing yeah so i've had a few run-ins with animals while running any run-ins with leprechauns no not that i could think of I had the skunk turkey standoff. Mm. I once saw a giant water snake slither up onto the road near my house. Whoa. I was running at night on the bike path along the reservoir that's not far from my house and turned a corner and almost ran straight into the side of a deer Ooh. in the dark. That was frightening for both me and the deer. It scared the daylights out of me, and I turned around and ran home, even though that made it a round trip of about one and a half miles because I was <laughs> shaken from almost running into a deer. So I ran home and got a headlamp and went running again. I was also running along the bottom of a raised railroad track. So the railroad track was maybe six feet above me. And I was running along the bottom. And a squirrel flew off the track area and bounced off my shoulder. <laughs> and uh, I've also had many dog and Canada goose run-ins while running. What about you? What's your, uh, what's your animal run-ins while you've been running? I haven't had that many. When I ran along the river in Boston, I saw skunks. I ran at, at dusk most days. And always skunks and a lot of times like baby skunks and scurrying across. I remember almost stepping on tons of little lizards in Florida, but I haven't mm. really mm. had too many encounters. My worst, my two worst things that I've ever encountered while running. One was when I ran into the side of a car okay, at that. basically <laughs> full speed. And that was more a shock to the car than me. But that's because there hadn't been a stop sign at the bottom of the hill I was descending until that day. And they put up a stop sign and I was expecting the car to keep going. So I ran full yeah. speed into it. But the worst I ever had, I was running out in the countryside many miles from whatever town I lived in at the time. And I managed to step into, with both feet, something that was like, a I don't know if it was a coat hanger, but it was about the size of a stretched out coat hanger. And I essentially managed to get my feet in it in a way that it created like a lasso effect. And I just went down head first in the countryside. Oh, it was when I was in college. And I had to jog several miles back to my apartment with like gravel embedded in my forehead. But I was the animal at fault there. There were no other animals involved. I was running in college once and I was running along the side of the road. And I took a step off the road because the car was coming. And I sank three feet down into some sort of Oof. cesspool. Oof. I went I went straight through the ground. <laughs> Luckily, it was only like three feet, so I could pull myself out. But I had to throw those shoes away, and they were my favorite pair of running shoes ever. I had some Nike Hirachis. They were the lightest shoes I've ever owned. They were the best. And I had to throw them away because I could never get the sewage stink out of them. It was gross. Um, since I mentioned a standoff between a turkey and a skunk, I spent some time looking for someone who may have had thoughts on who would win a battle between the two. Mm. I didn't really find anything, but I didn't think I needed to be anywhere near an agitated skunk or an agitated turkey, just in general. Yeah. However, it did lead me to a magazine called Fur News, F-U-R, Fur News Magazine, <laughs> a 1914 edition. There was a nice article in there about raising skunks for profit. A New Jersey skunk farmer, Paul Haydebank, had a large selection of skunks, and if the shipping company would only have allowed him to ship them, he could have sold all he could raise, he said. He certainly could have. The article failed to state why people were buying skunks from him in the first place, but I guess it was for the fur, since it was a fur magazine. Well, I can only assume that since he wasn't allowed to ship his skunks, and two yes. world wars erupted in countries to which he might have been shipping the skunks, 
that the skunks probably would have prevented the First and Second World Wars. Maybe. But I did also note uh, there were lots of advertisements in this fur magazine. Um, So it seemed to be an actual magazine. They had lots of advertisements from companies looking to buy furs. But almost every single one of them also indicated they were quite interested in buying ginseng. Hmm. And I went and looked this up, and it still does appear to be the case. Many of the folks dealing in furs around the country and in the world are also dealing in ginseng. And I didn't really know much about that. So I was looking. I just always assumed ginseng came from other countries. I didn't know that we really naturally grew it in the United States. Apparently we did. So while looking into why that might be, why they were all going for ginseng, I found out according to the Ohio State University Extension Service that Ohio wild Appalachian ginseng is the most highly sought after ginseng in the world. I didn't fact check it, but since the interweb said it was true and it was the Ohio State University Extension Service, I'm going to assume it was true. I'm going to assume it's true because I don't ever want to think about that subject again. Well, tangentially related to all this, I have often heard about Ohio State being a land-grant university. Yeah. Do you know what makes a university, Ohio State and others, a land-grant institution? Because in the former states of the Northwest Territories or something, they decided that they didn't want people to be dumb, so... Land was granted for the purpose of universities by some rich white guy before other rich white guys could exploit them. That's my guess. It's very close. Mm. They are called land-grant universities because of an act of Congress where they did want people to build universities. So they granted them pieces of land that they could sell and use to start a university. So the land granted to Ohio State to sell off was a total of 630,000 acres of public land located in 14 states, including Michigan, but none in Ohio, ironically. Mm. In 1862, so what lands were they selling? Mostly land confiscated from Native Americans. That makes sense. Yeah. And so mostly land was taken from treaties and unratified treaties and some not treaties at all. It, you know, it doesn't really make me feel good about celebrating land grant universities. Yeah, well, I don't drink beer anyway, so I'm not interested in celebrating land grants in the way that everybody does. But we started all this out talking about animals and fearing animals and outrunning animals and all these different things. I happen to know one man who fears no animal, but once outran all of them. He's our father, Art. So we're going to ask him some questions. If you had a balcony approximately four feet off the ground in prime elk country, would you sleep with the sliding door open? Uh, no. Do you feel like elks could jump that high? Yes. If an elk wanted to befriend you, what would you do? Probably give him some more. (laughs) Give him some more. What is the most frightening animal encounter which you can recall having, personally? Probably uh, something in the the ocean, because I couldn't, I had my glasses off and I I couldn't see the little critters and anything, even if they weren't there, I was afraid of them. What is the most frightening encounter you've had on a balcony? Oh, probably the. I'm, I'm not big on heights, and and the worst was uh, the little balcony or lanai we had in Hawaii. I had a hard time with sitting out there and looking out. I sort of had to stay by the doorway. I recall going on vacation in Michigan once, and you dropping the lens mm-hmm. cap of your camera off of sort of a balcony at a waterfall, maybe Tequanaman Falls. I don't remember exactly where it worked. And I had nightmares because I was at the bottom looking up and I had Angie climbed over to get your lens and then I'm watching sister Angie I had nightmares for years of Angie falling down and dying that is one of my biggest regrets I should have never ever allowed her to do that and uh, she was so desperate to help me that she did it and uh, I've had nightmares about that since which is cuter a turkey or a skunk well definitely a, a skunk would you raise skunks if you could be certain that people would buy them? No. No? No. Have you ever confused either a lagoon or iguana with a croissant? Uh, No, I know my croissants. You know your croissants. Have you ever had a cronut? Uh, No, I I haven't, although it seems as much as I like donuts that I, I probably should.
Well, folks, now that we've heard from Father Art, it means that our time together is coming to an end for this episode. We've said just about everything we're prepared to say about high-jumping Javier Sotomayor, baby rabbit salads, croissant creatures, fur magazine, skunk farmers, Lydia Moss Bradley, and Boris Koslowski's borrowed balcony horse. But fear not, just as soon as we can dig back into the archives and find another gem of a text exchange, there'll be another episode coming your way. In the meantime, you can head over to our Instagram page at Things I Text My Brother Podcast to drop us a note about what you liked, what you didn't like, or to tell us about something we got totally wrong. You might even have enough time to go tell a friend, an enemy, and a total stranger to give us a listen as well. If you manage to do any of that, the fraternity of Druyards will be forever grateful. But most importantly, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. Hello? All right. I think we nailed that one. Wasn't that beautiful? That it was, was great. If you're not first, you're last. Kick it!